I'm really grateful for really bright lights right now because I'm an introvert and I would be on the back row if I weren't up here. So uh, thanks for being patient with me. Um, I know what you're all thinking. Uh, we kicked off the day with Nate Walkingshaw up here and you're like, why is Nate Walkingshaw back up on stage? Contrary to popular belief, even though he is a very handsome man, I am not Nate, Nate Walkingshaw, I'm Mark Rollins. I do lead uh, both the hardware and product uh, uh, excuse me, the hardware and the software design teams at Vivint Smart Home. Um, and right now, I'm feeling a little bit like this guy. Um, are there any sports fans in the, in the building? Um, I'm a huge Red Sox fan. This is uh, uh, an awesome pitcher. Unfortunately, he plays for the Cubs uh, as of yesterday, um, Craig Kimbrell. But he helped us win the World Series last year. Um, and as a closing pitcher, for those of you not into sports, um, he's, they're the pitcher that comes out in the eighth or ninth inning, and they're responsible for bringing home the win, right, after the game's been kind of hard fought. And, and, and I'm feeling like this guy. I'm the last, I'm the last speaker. Um, and so no pressure. We've had an awesome conference. We've learned a lot probably uh, drinking from the fire hose a little bit with, with some really awesome insights and data, and uh, I'm feeling the pressure to try to, try to bring it home. Um, so... I, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a storyteller. I'm going to try to just tell you a couple stories, and, and we can have kind of a relaxed time uh, here to close things out. Um, so I'm going to piggyback off, off of what Emily just talked about a little bit um, and talk about the business value of design. And she's done an awesome job, I think, of setting up uh, the metrics, the ROI. I'm just going to tell you stories of how I've tried to do it over, over the course of my career. And just as a quick introduction for me, um, I uh, started my, uh, my path here in the Valley. I went to school uh, here at, at Brigham Young University. Um, and after that, I've had the opportunity of moving around a whole bunch. Um, I, I went and worked in New York City to start my career, uh, moved to Austin, Texas, uh, Portland, Oregon, and, and now I'm back, uh, back to my, my roots, back to Utah. Um, I've had the opportunity of working in a lot of different spaces in design. Uh, I started out actually in advertising. Um, UX wasn't really a thing when I went to school, and, and probably a, that resonates with a lot of you. Uh, most of our jobs that we'll have in the next couple years don't exist today. Um, so I started out doing TV commercials and print ads. Um, after I moved to Portland, Oregon, um, I led a brand agency where we, we rebranded a, a couple dozen different companies. Um, and uh, after a few years of doing that, I uh, moved over to work at Nike, um, where I led the design team on the Nike running app. Um, and I'm going to tell some stories uh, about that product and some of my experiences there. Um, and then ended up moving back to Utah. Um, I wanted to work on something really innovative, something that no one had figured out yet. And IoT is the definition of that, right? Smart homes, thing, these concepts that people are still just trying to figure out where the, the great use cases and value um, lie. So, so that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing now. I'm going to ask the question and, and hopefully be kind of thinking about this as we go, but you know, how does design drive business value? I think Emily set up the, the why we should care about it, but how do, we actually, how do we actually do it? And she showed some of these slides. If you haven't taken a look at the McKinsey study she referenced, you absolutely should. Um, I spent some time with my team at Vivint Smart Home and we went through this. You can actually take the survey that they sent out to all of their customers. Um, and we did that as a team to try to kind of assess where we were. And, and this is my like obligatory uh, charts and graphs, I'm a designer slide, to say that there is an, uh, a lot of business value that comes from, uh, from having design uh, perform at the level that they suggest it should be. Um, you know, they're, they're showing here that there's a significant shareholder return uh, for, those, for those businesses. Uh, how many of you, of you subscribe or are or members of the Product Hive Slack channel here? You've got a, a bunch of you. Hopefully you engage in the conversation. Maybe you even saw this particular post. Um, uh, Emily referenced Jared Spool. Uh, he's a good friend of ours. Um, someone asked the question uh, and, and said, you know, hey, uh, what, you know, what is the, can anybody throw out some good examples of experience-first companies um, that have outperformed their competitors? 
And this was his response. Um, I thought it was awesome, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up here. But he basically said, it's not that simple. It's not as simple as saying experience for companies outperform their competitors. Um, you know, one might argue that Walmart is a great uh, experience. I came from Portland, Oregon, where, like, Walmart is, like, trying to even get a store. Uh, and, and others, like, like Portlanders, will say it's a horrible experience. Um, some love Apple while others despise their products and, and services. Um, she said, but here's the thing. Apple makes as much money on their phones as Samsung does on theirs. Even though Samsung tell, sells 10 times the units, Tesla's market cap is bigger than GM's. Disney makes more money off their theme parks uh, than Universal and Six Flags combined. Airbnb has caused a 30% drop in hotel occupancy rates. Uber is crushing the taxi cab business, single-handedly devaluing uh, the New York City taxi cab medallions by 90%. When what do all these companies have in common? A substantially better and more innovative user experience. And they said, here's one more. Uh, being, being one that works in the smart home industry, uh, I like this one. Um, Nest in its first three years made more money on thermostats than Honeywell did in 53 years. Then it sold itself to Google for $3.2 billion. Which comp company would you rather be, Honeywell or Nest? Because if your company isn't Nest in your industry, you're the Honeywell, right? I thought this was a really awesome, uh, awesome response. Um, so... We, you know, it wouldn't be a design presentation without uh, a Venn diagram. Um, we all work in this space, right? We see these, these beautiful circles and we're trying to hit the center, right? But how, how do you actually do that? How do you ensure that the experiences that you're crafting um, actually hit the center? Every day we come to work, uh, all of us are there to, because we care, because we actually want our products to succeed. Um, nobody shows up trying to sabotage things, but it's really, really hard um, to hit the center of this uh, between consumer needs, your business's needs, and whatever technical constraints your, your products might, might face. So I'm going to talk to you about two stories um, over the course of my career, one uh, from Nike in, uh, in my not-too-distant past, and then one from Vivint Smart Home uh, that we're actively working on right now. And the concept I want to talk to you about is this idea of 10x or 10%. Um, every product uh, goes through um, an evolution, a life cycle, right? And we have to make decisions as we go um, whether we're going to 10x the experience or we're going to 10% the experience. Um, and there's lots of tools that help us decide sort of which, which one of these things we're going to do. Things like A-B tests are great um, in the 10% space. They help us localize small problems and figure out solutions that are going to solve small problems. But what do you have to do if, you're going to, if you need to revolutionize something? Uh, what do you have to do if, if those micro iterations over time aren't adding up to the, the vision that the product should have? Um, I'm going to tell you a story about... Uh, about my experience uh, at Nike. Nike was really good to me. Um, this is my closet. My kids play this like how many like how many beans are in the jar with my shoes when their friends come over. Um, we're somewhere like in the hundreds. I'm not sure exactly, but um, I haven't counted in a while. But but Nike was really good to me, and I learned a lot. Um, as uh, as we were talking backstage, I was talking to someone, and, and we joked, and we said that when you say that, I learned a lot, that really means, oh, crap, that was really hard. <laughs> I learned a lot at Nike. Um, it, was a, it was a great experience, right? Um, but the pressure was on, and, and it was really tough. Um, as I mentioned, I led the design team on this product, right, the Nike Plus running app. Um, this is a couple uh, years old now, these screens. Um, but this is more or less uh, the app that I inherited when I joined the company. They said, hey, we want you to go and we want you to work on our legacy product, right? The fuel band was a thing, but it was, it was kind of subsiding. We, they were getting out of the hardware space. Um, and, and they recognized that they had a gem uh, in this product. Um, but uh, as, as all things... Uh, that are legacy <laughs> are, um, it also came with uh, a whole lot of baggage, right? If you recall, the, the product actually started here, right? Before smartphones were even like smartphones. 
Um, there was a little puck, a uh, GPS puck that you would put in the bottom of your shoe when you went out on a run, and you had this little piece that you'd plug into your iPod, and then you could listen to music, and when, at the end of it, you could log on to a website, and you could see all of your run data, and it was magical. It was amazing. Um, but when I inherited this product that had started here, it was this, right? Uh, do any of you work on products like this, where you go to solve one little thing, you think, and, and it's a house of cards, right? It's just like 10 other things break, and you find yourself in like bug fixing mode more than you are like actually delivering real value to consumers, and it's just a frustrating game, especially as a designer. Like all you want to do is deliver value, and you're like, we're just like, we're just fixing the same stuff over and over and over again. Um, it was really frustrating. And so um, through a lot of conversations, we, we decided to do something bold, right? We decided that we needed to 10x this experience. And our process, and I'll tell you some of the things that maybe along the way I would have done differently, um, but our, our process was we're going to dim the lights on the Nike Plus running app. And for the next year or year and a half, we're going to be focusing on redesigning the thing from the ground up. And, and that sounds exciting uh, at, the, at the start, but man, is it wicked hard, right? I learned a lot. Um, uh, <laughs> the, um, so we dimmed the lights on this thing. We started, we started to redesign the app. Um, and a year, year and a half later, we, we woke up one morning and, and we launched this product. And we were so proud of ourselves. We patted ourselves on the back. We thought we had just killed it. And um, we learned through the hard way that when our customers who love our product uh, have like auto updates on for their app, they woke up one morning early. They put on their running shoes. That's already hard enough, guys. I don't know if there are there runners here in the building. Like, like it's it's hard, right? It's to be motivated. They put. They woke up early. They got their running shoes on. They're out on the street corner. They open their app and they went, "What the crap is this?" Right? I, they're like, "I don't even know how to start my run. I've relied on this product for years. What happened?" Um, and and this is this is really <laughs> this is really what happened. Um, it was it was an interesting uh, interesting time at Nike, right? You, you don't love when the Verge is writing articles saying that you know we redesigned our app and users are really angry. And how about this one, the Cult of Mac? Why did Nike ruin its beautiful running app? The media is awesome at dogpiling. They do a really good job of that. And uh, and this was just uh, this was a gift that kept on giving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we, we knew that we had set out with a vision and an understanding of why we were where we were. Um, I, I, I'm going to take a step back um, now that we've gotten to this point. We, we had gone out and uh, had done a bunch of user research, right? Nike's really, really good at understanding the soul of the athlete and being very, very customer obsessed. Um, we saw that the market was moving into a more social space for running. Um, run clubs were popping up all over. Communities were, were emerging that had never existed before. And we knew that we had to deliver an experience that leveraged this evolution in the running world. Um, and we believed in that, even though this happened, right? E even though everyone around us was saying, you are completely idiotic. Um, and so, you know, as, as the story goes, uh, this is maybe more of it. We went from, you know, four and a half stars um, to one and a half stars almost overnight. Um, the, <laughs> the crazy thing about the star rating, I actually don't really care about star ratings in apps. They're totally gamed. Um, they're not a metric, I think, that we should be using to validate, like, we did a good job or not. Because um, there's a lot of ways to game those, those mechanics, and they're not really a very good pulse um, for that. However, uh, Nike decided that they, that they cared. Um, <laughs> not surprising. Um, there's, Nike has this thing called the top four, right? It is a, uh, sounds like a good thing. 
Um, the top four is this meeting that happens with Mark Parker, the CEO, and all the executives, and they identify sort of like the top four problems that the business is, is facing at any one period. You see where this is headed, right? <laughs> that the business is facing at any one point in time. Uh, I think that like the global economy of Brazil was on that list at the same time as the star rating of the running app, <laughs> right? Right? We weren't sh we weren't selling product in a country that was impacting you know probably millions of dollars. And I know oh, by the way the running app is going through some hard times right now. Um, so. You know, you show up to work and, and all of a sudden there's a lot of people in the building that you, you didn't see before. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people in button-ups um, that, that uh, weren't typically hovering over your computer monitor. And a lot of them were asking, like, like what did you do and how, and how fast can you get it back, right? So I'm, I'm telling this story primarily to set up, like, um, the, the, when you have a vision for something and you feel like you've done the research and you understand the consumer, you have to see it through. And I'm going to tell you, the story ends happily. This is a Disney movie. Um, uh, but it required some incredibly thick skin, right? Um, so we, we knew at the onset that we wanted to deliver a product that uh, allowed runners, like I said, to run in different ways than they had before. So in the existing app, you could kind of do these, two, these first two ways to go out and run. You could go on a quick start run, meaning you could show up at the street corner, uh, press a button, and, and go for a run, um, and it would just track whatever you did. You could set a goal like this. You could say, hey, I'm actually going to run a 5K or, or whatever distance. And then you'd hear in-ear audio guidance coaching you to that goal, which was great. But it was still shallow, right? It still it didn't capture kind of this new evolution that was happening in the, in the running community. And we, we wanted to deliver this. this is, we called it Signature Runs. Signature Runs was basically a, a catalog or a library of, of in-ear audio guidance that would just whisk you away. Have you ever been to SoulCycle, uh, Barry's Boot Camp, Peloton's kind of in this space? Um, it's, it's, it's great for people like me that have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning to work out. Um, I need to be motivated and I need to be, frankly, distracted. I need to be, I, I need to be entertained through, through the pain <laughs> that, that is running for me. I'm a big guy. Um, so I'm going to show you just a, a couple screens here, and there's a little bit of audio of, of kind of what uh, a signature run was like. Welcome to the Nike Plus Run Club. I'm gold medalist and world record holder Michael Johnson. While you take the next 30 seconds to continue your recovery, I'm going to tell you about our next interval. This one's for 90 seconds. You'll start at 10K pace for only 60 seconds this time, and then shift to 5K for the final 30 seconds. Remember, running fast means running strong. Stay loose. You're going to look good, and you're going to feel great. We're starting in 10 seconds. When I count down to one, hit start on the app and get moving at 10K pace. Interval two starts in five, four, three, two, one, go. All right, so clearly Michael Johnson is an optimist. But I don't know if I'm going to look great when I run, but I appreciate the sentiment a lot. And we, so we created this whole library of, of runs, right? We, we had some that were with, with Olympians. We had run clubs from New York City that you could tap into and feel like you were with like a cool community of runners that you, that you didn't normally get to run with. Uh, as you probably know, you know not, Kevin Hart is actually a, a, a sponsored individual for, for Nike and he would do stand-up comedy routines. Um, we've done stuff with Headspace. Um, even like signature playlists of musicians and music that you could only get uh, through, through this product. Um, and the, the amazing thing was is when, we, when we built this and when we launched it, the, the, the star rating 
went 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 up, right? It, it went up even further than the baseline of where it was, where it was prior. And this is my favorite. As I was preparing this, I dug around, um, and a couple months after the Cult of Mac asked me why I had ruined the running app, um, they published this article that said, "Go the extra mile with Nike Press Run Club." Here's 50 of you know of essential iOS apps, and we made number 23. You know, the bottom line: the Nike Plus Run Club is the best running app. Um, so I want to just kind of end this section of it, uh, talking about 10xing an experience um, with, this, with this thought. Um, intuition is imperative in design. Um, and this is not me saying that don't listen to the data. Don't, uh, you'll see in my next little case study that, that I don't believe that. However, we are tastemakers. We were hired to be tastemakers. We have to understand the consumer at the consumer's level, and we have to know and anticipate what they need, even if they can't articulate it to us. Right? So don't devalue design. Don't take innovation. Inno uh, intuition out of design. N Nike was founded on this, right? If you know the story at all of Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman um, as, they, as they built the, the, their company, um, they had a vision. They knew that there was a lighter, faster, and better running product uh, out there to be made, and, and runners weren't asking for it. Um, and, and as they did, as they built that, um, the, the, the rest is sort of history. You know, intuition continues to be at the, at the forefront and the heart of, of their company. Um, they've built one of the best product brands uh, in the world. So I'm going to shift now uh, with the last few minutes and talk about, so what, what happens when we need to 10% an experience? We can't, you can't 10x it always. And I'll be honest, Nike maybe does this sometimes a little bit too much. Uh, you know, it's sort of a quarterly, like, let's reinvent ourselves, right? That's too much. You, you, that can then sometimes lead to a frenetic and disjointed, confusing product experience. Um, so more often than not, we're going to be in this space, right? We're going to be incrementally improving our products over time. So I'm going to tell you a story uh, about how we do that at Vivint Smart Home right now. Um, we uh, have adapted and, and used this sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs like pyramid um, that Aaron Walter wrote in his book. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, it's called Designing for Emotion. Uh, uh, in 2011, he wrote this. Um, and he basically takes a, a paradigm of a Maslow's hierarchy of needs and he says that users are, are the same, right? They have a hierarchy of needs. Um, and at the base, there is, a, there is a functional base that has to be maintained. And he describes it like this. He says, you know, if a user can't complete a task, then certainly uh, they, they're not going to spend much time with the application, right? That seems pretty clear and obvious, I hope. Um, but you have to actually be fulfilling a functional need for, for the user. And building, building on top of that, you have to do it reliably. You have to be able to predict over and over and over again that that functional need is going to be repeatedly delivered. Um, otherwise, you're going to leave and go somewhere else. You're going to go try to fulfill that user need in some other way. On top of that, the experience has to be usable. Right? Um, it should be relatively easily uh, understood uh, to intuit kind of how to use the experience. Um, you shouldn't have to relearn how to use something, is, is his point of view. And then at the top of the pyramid, and this is the one that's like tough, right, is this like pleasurable part, right? What if an interface could help you com uh, complete a very critical task and it could put a smile on your face? I want to talk for just a minute about this pleasurable tip because as designers, I think um, all too often our discussion like lands here and stays here. We're talking about whether like animations are in scope or not, right? And we're missing the whole point of design because it should we should be talking about this whole pyramid. So I'm going to talk for just a minute about Aaron Walter's version of pleasurable. Right? He talks about this, this concept and difference of like deep delight versus surface delight. You can have a, a surface uh, experience with, with delight when, when like, there's beautiful visual design or there's aspects of the experience that, um, that are really appealing. But again, if it's, if it's shallow, if it's not fulfilling the functional base, if it's not done reliably, if you have to relearn how to use it, you're probably going to abandon it. In fact, you can actually 
hate the experience more if it's really beautifully designed and doesn't do those things, right? So the, some aspects of design in isolation can contribute to a worse experience. So he describes this concept of deep delight, and I liked it. He said that deep delight only occurs when the user has reached a state of flow. That is, that they're immersed in the productivity without much distraction from the main task. In other words, deep delight is experienced when the interface behaves kind of like a surgeon's assistant. Uh, they're you know, knowledgeable and they're handing the tool to the surgeon at just the right time without getting in the way. I liked that kind of analogy. And then for those of us that have to live in the world of NPS, I liked this bottom statement too, which is users who experience this state of deep delight, they're much more likely to recommend the product uh, to a friend. And, and as I said, how many of you end up like talking about design with your companies and your colleagues uh, in a pyramid that looks like this, right? Um, I actually, sometimes I'll go and I'll draw this <laughs> on the whiteboard of an executive. And I'm like, I know that you care about this color palette or that font or whether the animations are in scope or not, um, but we're spending all of our time talking about you know, this small piece of, of the pyramid, can we, like, we gotta drive our conversation deeper to, to um, more meaningful aspects of the, of the experience. Remember, designers were tastemakers, right? We should be able to fulfill and, and deliver on those things without a lot of debate. So let me run this through just like a use case at Vivint Smart Home, right? Um, I'm gonna, we launched our doorbell camera experience in 2015, I think. That was back before Ring, back before Nest, Hello. Um, we were one of the first doorbell cameras to market and it continues to be one of our absolute marquee products. Um, so I'm gonna run you through kind of just that, that experience of like someone rings my doorbell and I now have a video doorbell, how is that experience better, right? So. There is a functional need here. I actually need to know that someone is standing on my porch wanting to sell me a uh, cable. Um, <laughs> or not. <laughs> we'll get to the screening part of that later. But um, So there's a functional need. I need to know uh, and get a notification when someone is at my door. Um, that notification needs to be timely, right? Um, if I react too late to that notification, then the individual is going to be gone, right? Uh, they're not going to be standing there anymore. So we would write something like this. We would say the notification is delivered on time and it has to be within one second of when that button is pushed. Um, that experience has to be usable. When I get the notification on my phone, we're, we're training users to do something maybe that they've never done before, meaning they can actually launch an app. They can see visually who's uh, at the door. They can use a microphone and, and have a two-way talk conversation with that person at the door. Um, so the notification has to be clear and clearly understood of here's how I take action on this, on this event. And then finally, this, this pleasurable tip, hopefully this kind of lands the plane of what I'm talking about with this surgeon uh, uh, handing the right tool at the right time. It's like, if I get that notification and I'm in a meeting and like three hours later I decide to go back and see who was at my door but they're no longer there, when I tap on that, don't take me to a live view of an empty doorstep. Right? You now know that I'm looking for an event that's in the past. Please take me to that event and show me who it was. Right? So that's that surgeon's assistant. Like, oh, cool, I understand what you need, and, and here it is at the right time. Right? So this is kind of how we have embraced this pyramid. Um, and we, we talk about something with every single release. We call it Deliver the Sliver. You can, uh, you can take that, you can steal it if you want. Um, it's pretty great. Um, <laughs> but when we, when we go out to release a product, it is imperative that you actually deliver an experience that touches all four of these, these sections, right? It has to be functional, it has to be reliable, it has to be usable, and it has to be pleasurable. So you have to, you have to deliver a cross section of that. Um, running out of time, so I'm gonna go fast. Um, yes, this is a design presentation and I put an Excel spreadsheet up. Um, how sexy and beautiful is this? Um, but this is what we do, right? When we design an experience, we actually map out every component, every micro component of the experience. We have buckets for functional, usable, reliable, and pleasurable. We call it FRUP. Um, 
and, and we write more or less the acceptance criteria for that feature as it scales throughout these different sections of, of the experience. Um, this has been proven invaluable, by the way, as we've like, sat down now to talk with engineers. Um, because it's allowed us to say, hey, here's the whole scope. Here's the, here's the full thing that we're trying to go out and deliver. And all too often, uh, we would get into a place where engineers would be building whatever the first thing was that we had done, and, and that might be like, you know, animations or something else, right? That may be something that, that uh, takes all of the bandwidth for the engineering team, and we, we were left later saying, oh, crap, if we'd only known that that's how much time you were going to take on this small piece of the experience, we, we would have actually made totally different trade-offs. We, we would have had a, uh, had, had a, different, like, uh, a different ask for you. And, and so this has helped us a lot. It's helped us to try to have the right conversations early in the, in the process and to find the experience up front. Um, this deliver the sliver, we, we've also kind of talked to it about like shipping a cupcake. And I'm not talking about like this cupcake. I like food, but, but I kind of, I'm not a cake guy. Like I pass on this cupcake at a party. I'm like, that's really sad. I'm like, I'm talking about this kind of a cupcake, right? <laughs> like, like it's got to have all the pieces. It's got to stop you in your tracks. It's got to be something that you're like, I would be stupid not to eat that, right? <laughs> um, and then finally, um, Emily touched on this too. Um, it is critical when you go through this process that you also, at the onset, determine how you're going to measure whether it was successful or not. So in that same spreadsheet, I didn't show it, but in that same spreadsheet, we have columns for what are the KPIs for this experience. How will we know if we actually delivered um, on, on, on FRUP? Um, so I just want to end on that. There's two sort of stories from my past. Um, of, of 10x or, or 10%. Um, thank you. The thing they're most interested in are your shoes. I, I kind of anticipated that, but. So we got 13 me. people that say, nice kicks, Mark. Thanks. Thanks. These, um, they call these the black toe ones. Um, they're Air Jordan ones. I don't know if this is really what you want me to spend my time talking about. But, Please. But it sounds like you're interested. Um, the Air Jordan ones, obviously the first Jordan that, uh, that launched um, way back, kind of started it all. Okay. Now, the serious question. <laughs> all righty. Um, hands down, this is what they are most interested in. How much research, A-B testing, and validation went into the new app before its first release? Did none of that research help predict how customers would initially react to the new version? Yeah, so I mean, that's a great question. Um, A-B testing, honestly, little. Okay. Um, research, uh, exhaustive. Um, we, like I said, Nike, uh, Nike obsesses the customer, um, and we felt really validated with what we were, what we were setting out to, to design and, and deliver for the customer. There were other things that I kind of glazed over, I'll be honest, with the story of why the app tanked at, at the onset. Um, not too surprising, when, we, when you redesign an entire app uh, at one time, um, and you're designing to a, a, a date-driven scope, yeah. um, it's not, un, uh, it's pretty ex expected, I think, to have a lot of bugs, right? So there was, there was some inherent just run tracking bugs that were making people upset. Okay. The one thing I will say, though, as we obsess the customer, uh, and this is, where, this is an, uh, an area where maybe the data lied to us a little bit, we, um, we saw that there were a couple key features that were rarely used. Uh, badges, uh, awards, trophies, some of these relics from like the old gamification days, right? And, and we decided to put those on ice for our MVP. We said they're not super important, very small subset of our users actually use these, and so we'll, we'll get back to those later. Come to find out, uh, <laughs> those users are really vocal um, because they're, because they're also the users that are using your product religiously. So, um, so you have to, you know, the, the data and the metric in and of itself only tells yeah. a part of the story. And that's really where the balance of qualitative and quantitative research come to play. Um, you've got to, you have to be able to do both sides of that. Well, I like that you mentioned the data because there's one data point that really struck a chord 
uh, with the audience, and that was the reviews in the App Store. Uh, they were saying, it's, you know, what motivated you to do a full rewrite when it was, had four and a half stars? Yeah, uh, that happens all the time, right? It, um, even, even at Vivint now, we're in the midst of going through um, kind of a vision exercise and talking about, is it time to 10x our experience? And we're right on the cusp of this. And, and that's inherently a question that we get all the time from executives. They're like, it's got four and a half stars, yeah. right? And, and the reality is, I think, um, you, like I said, you have to understand your consumer better than anyone else. You have to understand your consumer maybe even better than they understand themselves. I mean, what's the adage? It's kind of trite and, and overused, but you ask someone if, you know, if they need what they need in their horse, they're going to say a faster horse, not a, not a new car or whatever, not a new means to a mode of transportation. So when you're trying to do something innovative and you're trying to revolutionize a product, you have to... You have to take some big risks. You have to take some gambles, um, and uh, and I think it can it can really pay off. I mean, there are a lot of companies that have done that um, very effectively. It's got to be uh, based in reality, and it's got to be based in the customer. Yeah. But if you know, all strategies I think are are right. It's like um, if they're grounded in in the customer, uh, your strategy is right. The execution and the flavor of the execution may be may hit or miss but the strategy is going to be right. Well said. Thank you very much. Mark.